Thank you, everyone, for joining us. us. This is the first in what I hope to be a series of podcasts called Supreme Myths. And it will be mostly about Supreme Court and Supreme Court decisions, but hopefully not entirely. I am incredibly excited today to have as my first guest one of the most prominent and important constitutional law and other things uh, professors in the United States, Jack Balkin, the Knight, the Knight Professor of Law and First Amendment at Yale Law School. Jack has written a ton of books, more articles than anybody could count. He started the legal blog Balkanization, which is a leading uh, legal blog. And um, after 30 years of being in the field myself, I can say that few people in America have contributed as much to interesting, provocative discourse about constitutional law as Professor Jack Balkin. Thank you, Jack, for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm, so what are we going to talk about I'm, today? We're going we're gonna to talk about baseball. Uh, no, we're not going to talk about baseball because it bores That's me to death. Um, so, Jack, yeah. I want to talk about, you wrote two books in 2011, not just one, but two. And someday yeah. we'll talk about the second one, but the first one I want to talk about is a book that uh, was titled by you, Living Originalism, based on okay. an article the you had written. Book. The second Jake. book. The first book was called Constitutional Redemption. Okay. In time, this, okay. Um, yeah. And when this book came out, everybody, there was a collective gasp in the academy on two, on two grounds. One, why is progressive liberal Jack Balkin self-identifying as an originalist, and even if he's living? And two... What the heck is he talking about? So why don't you tell us why you called your book Living Originalism? Okay, well, that's a great question. I, uh, I had been doing this, actually. Uh, the book came out in 2011. I had started doing this in 2006 or 2007. So I had been working on the book for about four or five years. I'm a synthetic thinker by nature. I, I, I think that people I agree with have good ideas. I think people I disagree with tend to have good ideas. I tend to try to see how I can synthesize uh, lots of good ideas that people have and sort of make sense of them. Uh, it was my sense that um, uh, there is something in originalism uh, which actually makes a lot of sense uh, for Americans and also for uh, 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 legal scholars. Uh, but I am, I come out of, as you know, the living constitution tradition, a le legal realist tradition, actually, not just a living constitutional tradition. And, and so for me, the question was, what is it in originalism which is important and needs to be preserved and brought into a grand synthesis of constitutional theory. So that's what the book was about. And the book really is a synthesis. It really does give you an account of the way to understand our constitutional tradition that is both originalist and also living constitutionalist. And one of the conclusions in the book, many people found surprising, is that they're, they're saying the same thing, really. That they're flip side of each other. So you refer to them as the flip side of the same coin. And so I want to ask you, What's the coin? Well, um, so one way of thinking about it is this. Uh, around the time of the 20th century, it becomes obvious to anyone who's paying attention that the world uh, that created the Constitution is gone. Um, you know, we just don't live in that world. And, and so that's what I call, what you might call a, 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 the, the experience of constitutional modernity. That is, hey, come on, we don't live in the framers world anymore. We have completely different technology. Our social relations have changed totally. People address each other differently. Life is just different. And so that's a problem of being separated from the past in some important way. And there are basically two responses that occur when you feel yourself in that experience of being separated from the past. Um, this is true not only with constitution, it's true with religion, it's true with culture. There are two basic moves. One move is you say, well, past, that was then, this is now. We got to go forward. Uh, they were wrong. They were awful people. Let's move forward. Let's uh, let's move toward progress. Let's move toward the light. That is one response to this experience of being moved from the past. And the other response, equally frequent, equally often employed, is no, we must return. We must try to regain what we lost. We have to restore or we have to redeem what has been lost in the past. Something was valuable there. We've lost it. We have to get it back. Now, this is not just about America. This is about almost any culture you can think of. But it's, it's true of religion. You can see these movements in religion as well, uh, in Protestantism and Catholicism and Judaism, the ones that I know best. But it's especially true of the American Constitution, in which the Constitution plays this role of a creedal text, of a text that we say we're Americans because we believe in the Constitution. And so it's not a surprise that during the 20th century, both of these things happened. 
You get living constitutionalism and you get originalism. And guess what? The folks who are doing living constitutionalism in the beginning of the 20th century are also doing originalism. This is generally not understood. FDR is making originalist arguments for basically a progressive constitution. And a lot of the people who are defending his views on the Commerce Clause are making originalist arguments to defend his views on the Commerce Clause. Uh, Hugo Black, the great uh, Supreme Court Justice of the Warren Court, maybe the greatest of the Supreme Court justices on that uh, auspicious court. That's the end of the podcast, but go ahead. Yeah, he's, he's an originalist. He's an originalist, and he's proud of it. And, uh, and he carries a copy of the Constitution around with him in his pocket. And for him, this is what it means to be a progressive. It means to be an originalist. This is lost by the time you get to the middle of the 20th century, I think, because what happens is, is that um, as things change, conservatives then basically pick up the discourse of progressives in the 20s and 30s. They basically just take that discourse and then they apply it to liberals. And then they, one of the things they pick up with them is they pick up the discourse of originalism. So if you understand the full history of the 20th century, originalism and uh, living constitutionalism are like two twins separated at birth. You know, they, they just, they, they arise together, they're constantly in relationship to each other, you can't separate them from each other. Okay, I, I want to uh, hone in a little bit on this idea of maybe being a living originalist, which I assume is how you self-identify. Can I assume that premise that you, okay. So yeah. if Justice Thomas were here, he would say, I'm an originalist and give us three minutes as to what that means. Yeah. If Ruth Bader Ginsburg were here, she would say, I'm a living constitutionalist. Here's yeah. three minutes on what that means. What, yeah. now I want to talk about Jack in the context of deciding cases, not your very rich, descriptive account of American change, but just you're a judge deciding a case. What does it mean to be an, a living originalist? It means that there is a basic framework of the Constitution, that it's the original meaning of the Constitution, its choice of rules, uh, standards, and principles, and silences, that that's the basic framework. Uh, and we start there. We always start there. We always start with the text. And then, because the framework is not enough to decide most cases, we have to build it out. We have to construct it. We have to create interpretations and implementations to make it work. So, for example, the Constitution has principles, equal protection, freedom of speech. The original meaning of the Constitution will not tell us how to resolve most questions of equal protection. It won't tell us how to resolve most questions of freedom of speech. A few, but most, not really so much. So we have to take it upon ourselves in this time, in our generation, in our world, to basically give meaning to and redeem these basic principles. That is what is the living part of living originalism. The originalist part is, in doing so, we always have to be faithful to the basic framework. The basic framework does not change, except if you amend it, but the, the text contains within it an obligation to later generations to implement itself in our time. That's our duty. It's our obligation. So maybe for the non-legal academics, even non-lawyers listening to us, I, I suspect I'm going to translate what you just said, not that it needs translating, to where the Constitution is vague and imprecise and leads to litigation, judges are going to have to build. Where the Constitution is clear, president has to be 35, two senators, judges are going to defer 99.9% .9 of the time, absent some kind of absurd absurd. Is and that those cases don't get litigated? Those cases don't get litigated. Right. That's well, it's the exception of the Eleventh Amendment, but we'll leave that aside. Well, we but uh, we can talk about that too. But here's the point: if you and I were to sit down and write a constitution, we would choose some combination of rules, standards, and principles. And you know why we'd do it? To, uh, because there are particular problems that have to be solved in governing. So, the President of the United States: Are we going to have a rule that says he he uh, he uh, serves for a reasonable amount of time? No, that's insane. It has to be a hard rule. Right? Are we going to say each state gets a reasonable number of senators? No, that's stupid. It has to be a hard rule. So if you're designing a constitution, if you think from the standpoint of the framers, some things have to be done in rules. Some things will be done by creating institutions and setting them against each other. The House of Congress against each other, the, the Congress versus the president, the states and the federal government. You want competition. So some things will be done that way. And then some things will be done by declaring principles, basic commitments that have to be worked out over time. Every constitution I know looks like that. They all have statements of principle. And, and ours is no exception. And ours is one of the first. And it does. And you know what? That's originalism. That's part of the way the thing was designed. And, and that makes sense, I think, because let's assume that 
almost all Americans agree freedom of speech is a good thing as a general abstract proposition. Freedom of religion is a good thing. Equal protection is a good thing. But we can't identify in advance all of the very difficult controversies those values are going to implicate. Now, your book suggests that the way we work those issues out, the hard issues, is obscenity speech. Um, do transgender people get the full equal protection rights of other people? Whatever the question is, your book suggests that it's a complex interplay between cultural, social movements, and what judges do. And I assume back and forth. Sometimes judges, judges um, implicate the social movements and, and vice versa. But here's my question. And it goes back to something Mark Tushnet, who blogs for you and is kind of a mentor for me, said 40 years ago, and, and I'm sure you've thought about this. Yeah. How do we rein in the judges when they act arbitrarily and capriciously? I, and let me just finish this question with one observation. I've never shared this with you, but yeah. your 1986 Law Review article, The Crystalline Structure of Legal Thought, um, yeah. 1986, uh, right. changed my career. It literally changed my career. Well, I'm I glad to hear legal that. For the good, I hope. For the good, I hope. Yes. yes. It began my journey to legal realism. Um, yeah. And I recommend that article to everybody. But leaving that aside, in that article, you express a kind of a legal, a core legal realist critique of law in general, much less Supreme Court law. Yeah. How do we limit Justice Thomas if we get five Justice Thomases on the court and they do things that are outside the bounds, which happens occasionally? How do we limit the judges? Well, the point is, if you're asking, is there some hammer you can apply, you know, to pound them in place like a nail? There is I wish there was, but sorry. <laughs> that's not how law works, right? You know how law works. You've been in law school for many, many years. But lawyers are a profession. Uh, lawyers like to think of themselves as reasonable people. They like to think of themselves as reasoning with other lawyers about common questions. And that those are the basic professional constraints on lawyers. There are political constraints that come from who gets to become a judge. So my, you know, I, I've said this before. If you don't like what uh, the Rehnquist court was doing, you should not, you or your parents should not have voted for Ronald Reagan. Um, if, if you don't like uh, what Justice Gorsuch is doing, I voted for Donald Trump. Um, that is to say, it really matters. It really matters who becomes a judge, and that's been true throughout American history. That's why the Republican Party is so, so focused, laser-like, on judicial appointments because they understand that the people who become judges will very much be reading these materials and see them through the lenses of their way of thinking about the world. That's true. That, that's just legal realism. But the question, the question you might want to know is internally, is there something in law that connects law to the Constitution? That's the internal question. The external question is, how, you know, what are the ways in which judges are shaped by their society or by their the appointments process? The internal question is, what are the methods by which lawyers should address constitutional questions? Right? Well, that's interesting because um, being a, a hardcore legal realist, I don't think there are any internal theoretical pre-commitments that will ever be successful in stopping human beings who have life tenure and unreviewable power from doing what they want to do when they want to do it, short of what they get away with, short of what they can get away with. Which is way, the, the, the statement you're making is a little talking past the question I'm asking. The, okay. The question you're asking is, you know, we know how the world works, and we know that if you put people whose values are such and such a way, they will see their values in the materials of the law, especially where the law has any gap or ambiguity or vagueness in it. You and I don't disagree about that. But the question I'm asking is a little different one. Somebody may well come to you and say, how can you claim that this interpretation of the Constitution is tied to the Constitution at all. In other words, what is the what is the basis of your justification to me that you're not just simply asserting your values, but that you're trying to, in good faith, interpret the Constitution? And I will accept that you will interpret the Constitution according to your values because that's what you do. But I want to know what connects your your interpretation of the Constitution. That's the question that you have to answer. It, it's not enough. In other words, if you're a legal realist, this question is not interesting to you. But if you actually think that there's a method of legal interpretation, it's a really important question. Well, let me ask you, I get that. And so let me focus specifically on Justice Thomas and how both and how academics should talk about Justice Thomas. I have written a lot about him, and I think I have established that 
99% of the time, he votes according to the 1992 Republican Party platform. And we can, we, we can cut it 10 different ways, but when we're talking about how he votes. You mean Pat Buchanan's uh, platform? You mean the Pat Buchanan platform? Well, I, 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 maybe, but, but, but certainly, to the best of my knowledge, in any case implicating the interests of the Republican Party, he has not gone the other way. Here's my question. Whether I'm right or wrong, whether it's 99% or 93% doesn't matter to my question to you, yeah. which is, what's the proper way for academics and people and citizens and pundits in the culture to talk about somebody who claims an interpretive method that is clearly the one not guiding his decision? How do we, if it was a governor or a president, we call them names. But people don't like to call, except for me, Supreme Court justices names. How do we talk about it? Now, when I'm going to ask you one further question. I'm sorry, this is what I do. What do you okay. want to achieve by the way you talk about him? That is, do you want to convince him to change his ways? Do you want to agitate for the election of politicians who will appoint different kinds of judges? Do you want to persuade law professors to think about and reason about the Constitution differently? What do you want to achieve by the way you want to talk about it? That, um, you, by the way, you can interview me anytime. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I know, but I thought, it's really important to answering your question. I want, my career has been devoted to demystifying the Supreme Court in 15 different ways. Life tenure, cameras, substantively. I think Supreme Court justices say demonstrably false things. Justice Roberts said a demonstrably false things in Shelby County at one of our key moments of American history. And mm -hmm. it's, he, he miscited a case. He took an ellipsis, left out a quote, and just and in bad faith did a demonstrably false thing. Now that's I a claim have... about legal craft. That's a claim about legal craft. It's not a claim about politics. The claim you made there is that a good lawyer would not have put the ellipsis in there. He would have given the full quote and just dealt with it through some kind of legal argument. So that's a claim about craft. It's not a claim about politics. It seems to me there are at least two things you might want to do in what you're talking about, Thomas. That's why after listening to you, I think I know the answer to the question I asked you. One is you want to demystify it and show that it's not actually guided by law in any important sense, but by politics. But the yeah. second thing you might be interested Which in. Which is not politics, values. Values writ large. Sure, values. But the second thing you might want to do would be a little different, and it would be internal. It would say, since this guy's on the court and he has some persuasive impact on his uh, brethren and cistern, uh, on his siblings, we might call them, uh, and since um, uh, people seem to think he's a great justice, and uh, right, how should we use the methods he claims guide him to argue for the, for the right interpretation of the Constitution? So that would be a question about how originalism might be employed, and textualism too, we'll get to Gorsuch in a second, might be employed uh, uh, from the standpoint of a different set of commitments. So there are two questions. One is the demystification question, that's external. The other is the internal question. Of, uh, given these uh, claims about methodology, well, what does that methodology actually take you to? What is the right way to do it? Maybe he's doing it wrong. Maybe he's not good in terms of the legal craft that he claims to be good at. This is your critique of Roberts. Roberts is a very fine lawyer, but he, he didn't do the right thing in terms of quoting material. That's not playing fair under the rules of how you be a lawyer. That's your claim. So those are the two things you could be asking, and I can give you answers to both of them. Um, well, before you answer those questions, I think yeah. I want to ask a question that you may not want to answer. I have publicly stated yeah. that Justice Thomas is a hypocrite. And when I say that, pe right, people give me that look exactly, because they're not used to hearing Supreme Court justices called hypocrites. We call presidents hypocrites, mayors hypocrites, governors hypocrites. Before we get to whether you agree with me or not as to whether he is a hypocrite, is there anything inappropriate with somebody who studies the Supreme Court for a living and has written and is an expert on Justice Thomas's jurisprudence and his off the court statements suggesting this man is a hypocrite? Is that wrong in form? Is that something we shouldn't do to Supreme no, Court? No, it's not wrong in form. It's, it's not wrong in form. It's a question of, of how you want to address people. And um, it, for me, I don't, you know, I don't call people hypocrites necessarily because I'm a very polite person. 
uh, I like, you know, I like to, 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 to make jokes instead of make accusations. That's just how I roll. But if you're, uh, you know, if you're a person who gets, uh, you know, who lives off white hot fury, if you're a person who's a crusader, if you're a person who believes like Savannah Rolla, the righteous shall live by faith alone, if you're that kind of person, well, buy ahead, go ahead, call people hypocrites, call them scribes and Pharisees, call them all sorts of names that you want. That's fine. I don't have a problem with it. Okay, I, there is some overcompensation on my part. Um, so let's talk about Justice Gorsuch for a second, because I think it I think it does relate to Justice Thomas as well. And before I ask you this, I will confess to the world, I am so frustrated right now with Justice Gorsuch and how we're talking about him that I want to scream. I'll try not to scream. Yeah. I read your blog post uh, the other day about the case, about the big Title VII case that came down, where Justice Well, Gorsuch... it's actually about the more general issue of what's yeah. happening in the conservative legal movement. Yes. There's a sentence in there I want to ask you about. But just so we're all together here, those people listening or watching, Justice Gorsuch wrote for a 6-3 court that gays and lesbians are protected by Title VII and transgender people. And transgender uh, it was a bit surprise to some people, I guess. It wasn't a surprise to me, but it was a surprise to some. When you wrote about that in the context of conservatives are freaking out, what does that mean? I thought it was a great blog post. You, there was a sentence in there that took Gorsuch, and again, we're back to the same point, that took Gorsuch at his word that he reached this decision because of what he calls textualism. Two questions. What do you well, think what he means by textualism? I think the sentence I think I said was that Gorsuch used textualism and many movement conservatives, at least social and religious conservatives, were very surprised. They thought, well, I thought he was on our side. And I thought that when he uses textualism, he's going to come out our way. That was very surprising to them. You're assuming it was textualism that drove the decision. No, I'm not assuming that at all. I'm assuming that textualism is the method he uses to decide cases. What may have driven the decision might be that he's a libertarian. What may have driven the decision from a realist standpoint, now let's talk about realism, maybe he knows transgender people, maybe he knows a lot of gay people. Maybe he says, you know, I just don't think it's fair to discriminate against them. But, in ter but he is committed to textualism as a method of public justification. That's how he explains to people why he rules the way he does. And for him, it was very easy, very easy to come up with a textualist argument for why gays and transgender people should win in this case. And indeed, it's not that difficult to get there. Uh, Andy Koppelman has been making this argument in the constitutional context for 30 years. It's, it's, not, it's not hidden, it's there if you want to see it. I got to interrupt. The author of the crystalline structure of legal thought is certainly not going to deny that in the context of what because of sex means, which is the language in the statute, there were equally plausible textual arguments on the other side. There were. You could make them, but you would have to abandon, he would have had to abandon particular things that he claims that he is faithful to. That is, the easiest way to do it would be to say nobody in 1964 could have dreamed in their wildest imagination that this would right. someday be used to protect gays, lesbians, and transsexual people. They could never have imagined it. And you know what? That may well be true. Uh, but the point is, he has committed himself in advance, in print, to say, you know, that kind of reason is not an appropriate reason for me to consider. I don't consider that reason. So the, the, the strongest argument, the knockdown argument that everybody would have used immediately is one that he has already told everyone is not available to him. So that actually yeah. makes some difference internally. It, it doesn't mean that that's the ultimate, to quote his opinion, but for a cause of his deciding the case that way. But it certainly shows you how his asserted methodology basically kind of says, I can do these moves, I can't do those moves. Now, by the way, this is a way you could criticize Thomas. Thomas, if Thomas says, look, I do these moves, I don't do those moves. And then he does those moves. You can yes. criticize him for doing that. You can criticize him for saying that. Yes, I, and I have at length. But going back to Gorsuch, we're going to move from the statutory case to a constitutional case, which lets me ask you two questions. Yeah. What's the difference between textualism and originalism when it comes to constitutional law cases? Is there a difference? It's a box of four. Textualism says we're interested in the text and inferences that can be drawn from the text. And in particular, in textualism, uh, people or textualists generally say we don't look at legislative history. We can look at other texts. We can look at 
the, the, the basic structure of the statute. We can use canons of interpretation. We can use dictionaries. We can use corpus linguistics. We can use all these tools, but they're all basically organized around the text. The text is the beginning and the end, basically, of what we focus on. Originalism is a different question. Originalism says there is something that happened at the time of adoption, which is fixed. That thing, whatever it is, intent, meaning, purpose, understanding, is fixed, and that has to guide our interpretation of the Constitution. It may not be conclusive, but it has to guide it. So you can, it's a box of four. You can be an originalist, but not a textualist. If you're an original intent guy, you're not a textualist, right? You can right. be right. a textualist, but not an originalist. If you don't think that original meaning is what controls, but you still think the text is the be all and end all, you can be a textualist and an originalist if you think that the text is where you begin, which I do, and you also think that original meaning is required, which I do as well. And you can be neither a textualist nor an originalist. If, for example, you're a sort of legal process purposivist who says that basically we the text is a starting point, but there are all these other considerations we have to, and you're also not an originalist as most legal process people were not. So it's a box of four. I assume we agree that for crystal clear text, we're all textualists and originalists because we're not gonna let judges evade crystal clear text absent the most compelling of circumstances. Yeah, and of course then people will start fighting over what's crystal clear, but I know what you mean. Yeah, okay. Now here, now I wanna go back to Gorsuch. So I understood your syllogism a few minutes ago to yeah. be Gorsuch identifies as a textualist this case, uh, the Title VII case, allowed him to use his textualism to uh, uh, announce a result consistent with his method, and whether or not he did and it because his values. and his values, and his values. Okay. And his values. He also identifies as an originalist, maybe more so than a textualist. Yeah. Okay. Um, Trinity Lutheran, Janus, Becerra, are three huge constitutional law cases where he completely and totally abandoned originalism. And in none of those cases, in all three of them, he struck laws down, and in none of them did he rely on original meaning. So when mm -hmm. someone says to me, Justice Gorsuch is an originalist, or says he's an originalist, I respond, really in his short career, there have been three major, three or four major constitutional law cases, he voted, he voted originalist in none of them. Right. How do we rifle through his textual alleged textualism when we already know he's not an originalist the way he votes, no matter what he says? Yeah. Now, by the way, he didn't write any of those opinions. Is that correct? Uh, no. In Trinity Lutheran, I believe he wrote uh, a concurring opinion, maybe. A concurring opinion, in which he said, right. And there, uh, I think that he he based it on discrimination on the basis of religion. That's what it went off on. But this more the, or less the, the statute discriminated between religious uses and non-religious uses in, in a government Yes, but the, the statute, the, the, the type of law at issue had been on the books since the 19th century in 38 different states. And, and, and Michael Ramsey of San Diego and a bunch of other people before the case came out, Janice is the same thing. Uh, academic originalists who I respect said all along about both of those cases, there is no plot, there's no persuasive originalist argument to strike down those laws. Yeah, I, so I, here's my view. I think that yeah. Janice much weaker case for making a plausible originalist argument of the kind he would make than Trinity Lutheran. I think there's actually a, 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 an argument you can make. It's not sure that I, I that you'd agree with it. I think that Becerra, Becerra the first of the original understanding of the Constitution, right, has nothing to do with it. And yeah. it's a question of how to apply the principle of free expression uh, in contemporary world. And so he's basically in the same boat I'm in. He's a living originalist. He's got to be a living originalist in Becerra. And he's got to be a living originalist. Living even originalist, Jack. That's your point. I agree with you. Yeah, by the way, let's go back to Trinity Lutheran. Here's the reason why a simple originalist model of what did they do or how do they think about it or how do they approach it is irrelevant. Trinity Lutheran reflects the clash between the idea that government should not make discriminate against religious people because of their religion which is a principle that you can see all the way back. That's not a, a new principle. With a different problem, which really wasn't their focus. We live in a world in which a lot of property, licenses, grants, programs are uh, come from the government. That is, the government creates licenses. A lot of people are employed by government, so they're government employees. And a lot of schools, private schools, get grants from the government. 
right? So basically you have a world, what we call the welfare state, right? It's the world of the welfare state, licenses, grants, subsidies, and so on. Now, how do you make the principle don't discriminate against people because they're religious, live with the principle that the government basically governs through grants, subsidies? Because when the government governs through grants and subsidies, it gives money to some people, but not other people because it has certain policy goals it wants to achieve, right? And so the people who thought about, the, who drafted the constitution did not think in those terms. They understood that there were things like government support for churches, but they didn't see this as the central way governments govern. And when you take the welfare state, that is governance through subsidy and put it together with the anti-discrimination principle, there is no necessary way to resolve the question. It's a choice that you have to make. So you can't simply claim that original meaning predetermines the outcome of this question. You yet have to an answer. he seems yet people like Justice Gorsuch and Thomas seem to make exactly that claim. Uh, Erwin Chemerinsky wrote the same year you wrote your article, 1986. Uh, his oh. forward for the Harvard Law Review was constitutional law is now will always be a clash of values, and there's no escaping that. And I think you suggest the same thing. Yeah. How do we as academics, that, and I think you believe that, right? You said, yeah. in most but, cases. So that's the way the world works. That is, yes. a constitution is a platform for people to argue about what they value. It's a way of making politics possible. It's a way in which we fight about our values instead of fighting outside them in civil war or in violence. We fight about our values in the constitution. That's what a constitution is for. And it means that because that's what a constitution is for, the way we interpret the constitution will always reflect our differences of value. It will always do so. When you say that's what a constitution is for, I want to use that sentence to segue into a recent article you wrote, and, and, and thank you for mentioning my work in it, where you talk about people who have gone from judicial uh, restraint to more of judicial activism or judicial aggression or whatever you want to call it. Well, and right, generations, generations have moved from one to the other. Yeah. Most individuals yeah. don't change, but the generations do change. Right. Now, I, but I want to make a different point on that because you actually, um, my fairly known public call for deference across the board is actually not political in that sense. I felt that way, I'm a liberal progressive, when Obama was president and we thought the court was gonna go left. Right. I wanna ask you about kind of a Rawlsian moment for this. We're starting a country tomorrow that's kind of like ours. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna have federalism and separation of powers and judicial review. I wanna hear your best defense for giving unelected, life tenured, elite lawyers the amount of power this society gives the Supreme Court of the United States. Because, I, and, and just one last context to that. When I talk to smart doctors, lawyers, and economists, and non-lawyers, but who are well-informed, smart people, and I start going into my, the court's not a court stuff, they all accept it. And they say, why, yeah, why would we do that? That doesn't make any sense. What do they know about abortion? Do you have a defense for this system? This crazy Absolutely, system. But it's, a, but it's a, but it's not, it's going to be only a partial defense because let me explain what I want to say. First, I want to tell you why you need judicial review, even in a high deference regime like the ones you imagine. Then I want to tell you how you need to design the judiciary, given the fact that you're going to have judicial review. I'm going to start with design. There is no other country in the world that I'm aware of that has life tenure for its constitutional court. That is the highest court. Um, most of them have eight to 10 years of rotation. They have many different kinds of selection systems. It is insane that we have a system of life tenure for our uh, Supreme Court justices. Uh, in fact, we don't really have life tenure anymore for the lower court judges because they basically uh, have to take senior status at some point. And uh, that's never been thought to, to cause a constitutional problem. So my view is that we should have term limits for Supreme Court justices. Um, and uh, I, you know, there's a Carrington Crampton plan, which I've advocated in different versions, a slightly different version of it. I talk a little about it in, the, in my book that's coming. I think I talk about it in living originalism too. It, but it's insane to have a system of life tenure. Um, but we agree on that, Jeff. Yeah. So, and by the way, if you basically say they serve for nine years, eighteen years, it really lowers the stakes of judicial uh, nominations, and it uh, and it lowers the incentives for constitutional hardball. For example, let me just give you a very simple example. 
Scalia dies in 2016. And uh, then there's constitutional hardball, basically, to prevent Obama from appointing anyone. Uh, and, and, you know, McConnell throws everything in the book. In the carrington Crampton system, guess what? One, Scalia would have been off the court for many years. He wouldn't have lived that long. He wouldn't have been on the court that long. Uh, two, if he had been on the court, if they appointed a very, very old man to the court, like, right, because it would be 18 years, then what would have happened is there would have been a system deciding which of the retired justices, which would have been Souter or Stevens, would have taken his place. So there would have been no reason to engage in constitutional hardball. McConnell would have nothing he could do. You'd have to wait for the election. And then the, in the first year of the pres new presidency, there would be an appointment. So constitutional hardball, basically, you, you don't have that problem. Second, it, it means that you don't find some young 32-year-old person uh, who basically swears fealty to some ideology and installed them on the court for 80 years, or I'm exaggerating. You just don't do that because they're not going to be around that long. They're going to be there for 10 years, 15 years, maybe 18 years. So you look for somebody who actually knows what they're doing, somebody who has experience, someone who's trusted, someone who's well-known, someone who's a known commodity, and you put them on the bench. And guess what? That inspires greater confidence. Okay, that's a question about design. Now let's talk about yeah, I, I agree with every syllable you just uttered, and I've written that, and I'm, frankly, more and more people are coming to that conclusion. Yeah, I think it's going to happen. I think eventually we're going to go, because every other modern Western constitutional democracy chooses differently. Chooses. I'm told Iceland might have life tenure. It's That's possible. It. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now let's talk about design of, of judicial review. When you think about post-World War II constitutions, most of them have judicial review. Now the question is why, given all the problems that you know of, right, and have talked, written about, there's several reasons. Here's reason number one. Whether or not you're going to defer to the legislature, the executive is always a loose cannon, and you need judicial review to keep the executive in line and to keep the executive from basically unilaterally violating constitutional liberties. So even if the, you defer to the Congress, the president's got to be kept in check. That's the first point. So you need judicial review for that. And that's why even in, in Great Britain and Australia and New Zealand, they have a, a, a kind of judicial review that's aimed just at the executive, which tends to merge administrative law with constitutional law. So they don't have a, a firm distinction like we do. That's point number one. Point number two, if you're going to have a federal republic, so you can have a unitary republic like France, but if you're going to have a federal republic like Germany or like the United States or Australia, you actually need judicial review because there are going to be continual conflicts between the national government and the individual states or the provinces. So you need it for that. And indeed, in the first half century of the Constitution until the war, most of the stuff is about those kinds of issues. They're about structural issues. And you need to resolve structural uh, fights between the president and Congress. So you need it for that, okay? So then that brings us to the question, well, do you really need it though for rights? Do you need it for the kind of rights claims that people fight about all the time? And the answer is you don't. You could do it all through a uh, federal statute. You could have a federal abortion law. You could have federal criminal procedure law. You could have federal civil rights laws. You could do it that way. But in this case, I think that the people that you really want to blame, people that basically designed the Constitution in a way that led almost inevitably to the situation you don't like, were the Reconstruction framers. Because the Reconstruction framers decided that it was too dangerous just to have laws, ordinary law, statute laws that protected the civil rights of freedmen. They thought about that. They debated it. And, and there's this key moment in the debates over the 14th Amendment. And, um, uh, and they say, well, why don't we just give Congress the right to pass laws that can protect the Bill of Rights and the rights of the freedmen? Um, and that's the first draft of the 14th Amendment. And then um, several people got up and said, no, that won't work because we won't control Congress forever. And as soon as the Democrats, remember, they're the party of the South, get in power again, they get control and they win by 1874, they're going to abolish everything. And there will be no protection in the states for the freedmen uh, or for white unionists. And there will be no protection of the Bill of Rights. So we have to have a constitutional amendment. So that's why you get section one in its current form. It basically takes off the table the possibility of a later Congress uh, stripping away constitutional uh, this rights protections. And then once you have the 14th Amendment, there's an almost inexorable logic to it. That is because it asserts that states can violate certain basic rights, then it becomes a political football. This is now I'm going to use your way of thinking about it for each generation to use the 14th Amendment as a way of fighting about rights. And there are all sorts of terrible ironies to it. So in the original version, the 14th Amendment is designed to protect primarily the freedmen. 
is primarily to protect black civil rights. Um, guess who it ends up protecting? Corporations. By the time you get to the Gilded Age, railroads and corporations are basically the major beneficiaries of the 14th Amendment uh, by the time you get through the Gilded Age. And it takes years and years and years of popular mobilization and not one but two reconstructions for the, uh, uh, the 14th Amendment to finally be used to protect the rights of African Americans. So that is a problem. But it's a problem that comes when you have a 14th Amendment. Now, I just want to tell you that Fra Frankfurter at one point, Felix Frankfurter at one point said, you know, maybe we shouldn't have a 14th Amendment. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> once you have the 14th Amendment, you're going to have this problem. Why? Because you have to discipline states, you see. So to discipline states, courts have to decide doctrine. You have to create doctrine to discipline states. And then the question is, will the doctrines that apply to states also apply to the federal government? That's the question. I'm not sure it's the problem of the 14th Amendment as much as it's a problem with what the Supreme Court did to the 14th Amendment in the 30, 40 years after it was ratified. But also, going back to your first point, the mm -hmm. structure of our court system, of, of the Supreme Court, is going to lead to um, government officials taking as much power as they think they can and and I think it, it could be done in different ways. So let me give you an analogy. And I have two more questions. Well, by the way, I just want to say this is very useful. This, this connects the design point to the problem of the 14th Amendment. The yes. 14th Amendment is less of a problem if you can somehow deal with life tenure and how judges are selected. Yes. That is, it's a combination of bad design plus the need to impose constitutional restrictions on states that produces what you're upset about. So you can either change the 14th Amendment or you can change the system of judicial uh, appointments and life tenure. When, I, when I'm sorry, I'm going to plug my own stuff here, but when I'm asked, as I am all the time, Siegel, why do you think the court is not a court? My answer isn't a soundbite. My answer is it's a perfect storm of a lot of different things, exactly as you were just talking about. It is both the structure and the open-endedness of our text and the tradition of strong judicial review that really began in the 19th century after after this, this Dred Scott. And, and, and I'm just going to go. I'm going to go even uh, one better on you. It's actually not true that judicial review has always been as strong as it is now. In fact, even after the 14th Amendment is adopted, the judicial review is still relatively weak from the perspective of today. It gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, from the 1860s to the present until 2000, you know, the Supreme Court decides a presidential election. Nobody thinks that the courts would be that strong in the antebellum period. You know, nobody thought that. They, nobody thought they would get, ever get that strong. The reason they get strong is not because they're power mad, crazed lunatics. It's because politicians use judicial review to uh, promote their goals. That is, uh, the, ju the judiciary has been built in the image of the political branches. It has been constructed by them to serve the purposes of the political branches. So that's a design question. So you might ask yourself, all right, since they're going to do that, how could we design the structure of the judiciary so that we can ameliorate the worst excesses that are likely to occur when, in fact, judicial review gets constructed that way? Yeah, I would like to see a two-thirds requirement for striking down laws on the Supreme Court. Any, anything. I don't need that, but but I, yeah. um, uh, but I, I but, but here's an example of something that, that people have advocated. But I think it just throws a fuel on the flame. So one idea is, oh, let's just court pack. Let's just increase the size of the court to eleven. Well, that does nothing to change life tenure. It does nothing to lower the stakes of judicial appointments. If anything, it just gets people even more angry at each other than they were before even more unreasoning than they were before. So what you want when you reform the courts is to lower the stakes of judicial appointments. That's well, the well, Jack, you, you are preaching to the choir. After Justice Scalia passed, I did kind of a country tour arguing we should freeze the Supreme Court at four Republicans and four Democrats for the rest of time. Um, so yeah, that- That's a terrible <laughs> idea. Because that, that just makes, that just puts party, that makes party identity central. Don't do it that way. I understand why you said that, but think about it from the general principle of lowering the stakes of partisan warfare. We happen yes. to be in a period of high political polarization. We have not always been in such a world. 
my, my forthcoming book is about this, that we go through cycles of high polarization and depolarization. And the, the country I grew up in, I was born in 56, you were born in 58, that was a period of depolarization. So the politics was completely different and judicial appointments were different, everything was different. But what we want to do is design a system that can work both in periods of depolarization and high polarization. That's yeah, and and the reason I knew my specific proposal would never be adopted, although Ed Whalen liked it for a while. But leaving that aside, um, that wasn't my idea really. My idea was liberals and progressives like you and I should not be in favor of strengthening the court to promote liberal and progressive causes. We should be in favor of turning the temperature down on the court. And that I take it you agree on that. Exactly yeah, okay. Right. So yeah, I, I have one last question. Judicial review is really useful, despite what you say. It's really useful, but if you put all of your hopes in it, if you build all of the power into it, it will only make you unhappy. It will disappoint you every time. You have to understand that it's a valuable feature of a constitution that has to be given an appropriate role. Not everything. It's something, but not everything. So this has been great. I could talk to you for two more hours, but I do have one last question. And it's a question that, um, it's not a secret. Most people know that I have a pretty strong relationship with, with Judge, retired Judge Posner, and uh, he and I would talk a lot. And he would often scream at me, we're dear friends, but that's how he did things, um, about one question that he thought was the question of all questions. And I want to ask you the question that he thinks is the question of all questions. Yeah, but if it's a question that, that, that Dick Posner thinks is the question of all questions, how do you think I could answer it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure you can. Yeah. And when I say question of all questions, when it comes to constitutional law in the Supreme Court. Right. And this is it. On balance, on balance, he always wanted me to answer the question, has the Supreme Court been a net good or a net bad for our country, our culture, our politics, uh, you know, since roughly 1857? We would, we would start at that Dred Scott date. And... He would say, until you answer that question, then you really shouldn't have proposals. You shouldn't have critiques. You've got to figure out what you think about that question, to which I would scream at him, that's an impossible question to answer, and then he'd scream back at me. I'm curious if you have an answer to the question and if you think it's an important question. It is an important question. And Dick Poser said it was impossible to answer. So how do you think I can answer it? I... I'll, do the, I'll do the best I can. Yeah. Um, Mike Klarman once said, and he said in his writings, Supreme Court has been no better or no worse than America. That the Supreme Court is neither a hero nor a villain. I think that's probably true. Uh, my, my this is also in the book. It's coming out on the cycles of constitutional time. When when things get rotten, when our when our institutions degrade, um, uh, the court is not very much help. It's actually most useful when things are going pretty well. Uh, when democracy is working very well, the court works very well. When democracy is not working very well, the court doesn't work very well. And so, in a sense, it's no better or no worse usually than uh, Americans themselves. But because of life tenure, it tends to be a lagging indicator of whatever is bothering Americans. So this court got polarized after America had gotten polarized for a long time. This court will stay polarized long after we depolarize. Um, so in other words, that lag, which people often see as a value of judicial review, can also be a problem in certain contexts. It was a problem in the 1850s. It was a problem in the 1890s. It's a problem today. These are all periods of what I call constitutional rot. Uh, all of this tells you that you cannot rely on the courts as a savior when you most need them. But if you understand the role they play and should play, they can be okay as part of a larger constitutional scheme. Okay. Um, I, I committed podcast malpractice by Forgetting one question, I do have to ask you. Otherwise, Twitter people will get very mad at us. So we really will finish at this question. There's been a lot of talk about the oath. Sandy Levinson wrote a column today on your on your blog about the oath. Professor Chris Green has written books and spent time on the oath. I've written something um, on it too recently because he asked me to. Chris asked yeah. me to write about the oath, so I did. Many of us think it is a completely irrelevant topic to anything important. I'm curious what you think. Well, I don't agree with Chris that taking an oath to defend the Constitution commits you to any particular constitutional theory of interpretation. Um, I do think that it's important for people who are clothed with state power to be reminded of the fact that they have been clothed with state power 
and that they should take it seriously and that they should uh, swear that they will preserve and protect the Constitution. I think that's important, but that's not a claim about the correct interpretation of the Constitution. I also think it's important for people to understand that they're becoming part of something that existed before them and hopefully will exist long after them, and they should have a sense of humility and respect when they are clothed with state power. And so for that reason, I think the oath is important too. Michael McConnell's early work on judicial humility, I think, is among the best normative work on how one should be a judge. And I think you're exactly right what you just said. Jack, I really appreciate this. I, I cannot tell you, it means a lot to me that you agreed to do it, that this is the first one of these is going to be. Um, and anything you want to say to close out uh, this podcast? I just want to thank you very much for having me. And I want to remind you that I have asked you, if you wanted to, to pose questions to me for the blog like Chris Green did and Charles Barson did and, um, and Evan Burnick did. So if you want to send any to me, I'll answer them on the blog and we can keep the conversation going. I intend to follow up, absolutely. Jack, thank you so much.